Welcome back everyone to the channel. Tonight's terrifying video, I am giving you four allegedly true horrifying deep woods stories. You decide. Now let's get spooky. Hey all, I've been a lurker here for a while, but today something happened that I felt I had to share with no sleep. The only word I could think of to describe the way that I feel right now is shocked. I'm writing because, to be honest, I'm a little freaked out right now. Just to clarify, I'm totally fine. It's my friend Kate who I'm worried about. She just returned from a few days of paid vacation that she spent camping in the Adirondacks and just contacted me about what happened during her trip. Below is the email she wrote me. I think she wrote it in both to get her own thoughts straight as well as to share the story. So I'm pasting her recap of the trip unedited right below. Since it was addressed to me, there's going to be a few things you won't get, but they don't really affect the overall main points. Anyways, here it is. I've always loved nature, you know that. The fresh air, natural sounds, just being able to take a break from the world, it's all there. Like I've told you many times, I'll take a weaving walk between pine trees and thorny underbrush over a weaving commute between sullen-faced New Yorkers any day of the week. And last week, when life got a little too hectic, I decided to do just that. The breakup with Steve last Tuesday had really just been the icing on the cake. I know I told you about this briefly, but it ended pretty ugly. He didn't take it well. But then again, we really didn't expect him to, did we? Should have listened to that old advice, never date a coworker. He just got too clingy and possessive. <laughs> Whatever. We'll catch on that another time. Point is, after all that garbage, I was done. I planned to use some of my few vacation days at work and scheduled a several days long solo camping trip in the Adirondacks. My family used to go camping there all the time when I was younger. It's just therapeutic for me now. I packed everything a day in advance to make sure everything was ready. A tent, sleeping bag, Cooking supplies and food, flashlights with extra batteries, first aid, and even my new camera. I wanted to make sure I got some great shots of the outdoors. That way, I'd have something to put on the wall when I was back at work and needed a pick-me-up. There was a few things I certainly wasn't bringing, though. I was leaving my iPhone, laptop, all that more modern stuff at home. It's not like I'd have Wi-Fi or be able to recharge them out there anyways. One small concession though. I did opt to bring my old iPod. Music and nature mesh together pretty nicely. And it's a bit obsolete now. So no worries if I lost it. Anyways, I was all set to go and ready to rock and roll. The next day I woke up bright and early. Drove out a few hours ditched my car in one of the camper lots, and off I went. It was amazing. I hadn't been out hiking or camping in years. It was exactly what I needed after a couple of particularly rough weeks. After a couple of minutes bobbling along on my own beat, the past few weeks had become a distant memory, washed away like the dirt off my boots when I jumped in the first creek I found. Alright, yeah, I know wet socks and hiking don't mix, but I was just too stoked to be out in the wilderness again. Anyways, things were pretty uneventful for most of the first day, until around late afternoon. As the sun started to set, the light filtering through the trees started striking me right in the face. I held up a hand to block it, cursing myself for forgetting my sunglasses. You could never remember everything, right? When I took my hand away for a moment, 
I noticed my arm had been blocking my view of something up ahead. A person. I'm not the type of person to make friends with random hikers in the woods, but I was in such a good mood that I continued on my way and approached that stranger. I waved a quick salute as I got closer, and he returned in kind. Hi there, I said enthusiastically. I'm Kate, nice to meet you. Have you ever gotten that feeling that someone is a bit off? And you could tell within a few seconds of meeting them? I got that feeling from this guy. Hard. Oh, hello. What a pretty girl like you doing all the way out here? He replied. Not the creepiest thing you could say, but I still really didn't like the way he said it. Camping, I chirped back. Out from the city for a few days to get away from it all, you know? He tilted his head. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm not from the city, but I know what you mean. Sometimes you just need to get away from people. His voice trailed off as he stared off into the distance. Then he promptly snapped his eyes right back to me. Are you camping with anyone else? He asked, leaning forward slightly. I suddenly felt very uncomfortable. Um, yes, my boyfriend. He's nearby, scoping out a campsite for tonight. I lied, feeling my face grow hot. I'm a terrible liar. Why would we split up hiking? I doubt he actually believed me. He was silent for a moment before replying. Oh, alright then. Well, you two be careful, you hear? There's a lot that can happen out here. He smiled slightly, nodding his head and then walked off. He had never even told me his name. Weird. I suddenly felt a lot more vulnerable out in the heart of where I've always felt home. I shook off the chill running down my spine. He was probably just another hiker, just a little weird. Nothing to freak out over. Regardless, I did notice that the sun was getting close to setting and needed to set up camp. A few minutes of hiking later, I found a suitable spot. I unloaded everything from my pack and set up my small tent pretty quickly. I felt pretty accomplished after doing that and made sure to take a photo of my newly finished tent. Something to bring along next time I see my parents to show them I still got the nature girl in me. After that, I scavenged around the area for enough wood to sustain a fire, cooked a quick dinner and laid down next to the small fire I had going. This was another one of my favorite parts, just listening to the nighttime sounds. Crickets chirping, occasional owl hoots, and even the incessant bastard cries of the whippoorwill would be a welcome change of pace for me. Stargazing was also a favorite, but the sky wasn't that good that night since there was nearly a full moon outshining most of the stars. It was pretty cold later that night, since it still isn't quite summer yet, so I was bundled up tight in my tent and took a bit of time to doze off. Compared to the past few weeks of trying to sleep, I felt totally relaxed. No need to wake up early for work tomorrow, or to deal with the hassle of commuting. I could sleep in and relax. Not even the nearby cracking of underbrush I heard from a raccoon or fox walking by was going to rattle me, even though it used to freak me out as a kid. Even though it didn't freak me out anymore, I slipped in my earbuds and played some relaxing songs on my iPod as I dozed off just to be sure that wouldn't keep me up through the middle of the night. I slept like a rock that night, and woke up refreshed and ready to go midway through the morning. After deconstructing my campsite, I continued on my way, going with the route I had planned out before starting my trip. The second day was even greater than the first. I hadn't felt that alive in years. I made sure to snap a bunch of nature photos throughout the day, 
and even took a few shameless selfies of me in the woods. I also met a few other hikers slash campers. They were a nice couple around my age, maybe a little older. I had a nice 10 minute chat with them and found out they had a lot in common with me. They actually reminded me a bit of me and Steve early in our relationship, you know, before things started sucking. I didn't think of that at the time, but I did after they happened to ask me an interesting question. They asked if I was out camping with my boyfriend. I was a little taken aback. The question resurfaced some recent memories I didn't want on my mind, but I told them it was just me. They said that they had ran into another guy not too long ago who was camping with the girl, but they were separated for a bit. That was interesting. The mountains were a bit more crowded than I remembered them being, especially since it really wasn't even camping season yet. The nights are still a bit nippy for most. Not for this couple though. They both loved nature and they were psyched to be out and about. I actually kind of wished I had stayed with them. Maybe then my trip would have turned out differently. Anyways, I tried to paint a pretty detailed picture of what the trip had been for me so far so that I could frame what happened next a little better. Remember what Danny always said? Shit just got real, man. Well, shit's about to get real. When the sun started setting, I picked my second campsite that I'll be using for the upcoming night. I did everything pretty much identical to what I described last night. Set up the tent, firewood, cooking, fire, etc. When I was through with soaking up the stars and nature sounds, I got into my tent for the night, curled up in my sleeping bag, and started to get ready to sleep. I wasn't too tired yet though so I decided to reflect on my day a bit. Hanging my flashlight as a makeshift lantern, I rummaged through my belongings until I found my digital camera and started going through all the pictures I had taken over the course of the day. There were some really great nature shots, interspersed with my lovely selfies, of course. I think I went a little overboard on the trees, though. After going through the 10th seemingly identical tree shot, I just skipped the camera to the start of the pictures so I could see what else I took before going tree crazy. I accidentally went a little too far though. Damn it. I still had the most recent pictures of me and Steve on here. It's seriously like that thing just keeps following me everywhere. I hastily skipped forward through those before getting to the pictures I started on the trip. There was one of me waving goodbye to my car civilization, the first creek I found, and a few shots from the first day. Then there was a shot of my tent that I had taken right after I finished setting it up before wandering around to get firewood. I clicked forward on the next picture, another shot of my beautiful tent. I stopped curious. This one was taken when it was way darker. The tent was visible only by moonlight. I froze, and it dawned on me. I had not taken that picture. My heart started to race. No, calm down, I thought to myself. Maybe you did take that picture right before bed? Hands trembling, I clicked forward on the next picture. It was my tent, lit by moonlight, again. What the actual F? My heart was pounding like a jackhammer at this point. I didn't know what to think. I clicked forward again. My tent, lit by moonlight but closer, taking up more of the frame. No, 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 this can't be real. I clicked forward again. An even closer shot of my tent, with almost none of the dark surrounding woods visible. I was about to cry by how freaked out I was. Please stop now, but I had to know. I couldn't stop myself from clicking forward again. This time, a hand visible in the picture, reaching towards my tent zipper. 
I was now fighting back sobs of terror. Click. A hand unzipping my tent's flap. Click. A view of the inside of my tent. Click. Me, sleeping. Click. I couldn't stop myself. I let out a loud sob of terror at this point. Just then, I heard a loud crack outside of my tent, like I had surprised something with the noise. I became dead silent, straining to hear anything over the sound of my beating heart. Silence. Where did the sound come from? I shivered as icy chills ran through me. What if they're out there right now? I had no idea what to do. Never in my entire life had I ever felt so terrified or alone. What was I supposed to do? As much as I wanted to nope the F right out of there, it was in the middle of the night. He, she, whatever could be anywhere. So the only thing I could think to do, nearly paralyzed by my fear. You know, when you used to be a little kid and you would wake up in the middle of the night really having to go pee, but you would be too afraid to leave your bed since monsters might grab your legs from under the bed if you got up so you wouldn't pee. Well, that's what I did. I was too scared to move. Trembling, I turned off the flashlight and laid my head down. If you had any doubt over my decision-making abilities before this, please allow me to clarify. They are terrible. There was no way I was sleeping that night, that's for sure. I just laid there, eyes wide open, heart racing. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, praying for the sun to come up so it would be alright. And then I heard it. The cracking of leaves and underbrush. The shuffling of footsteps, slowly, steadily, stealthily, coming closer and closer. I would have gladly taken a pissed off mother grizzly bear in place of what I knew those footsteps must have belonged to. They were back. I had no weapons, no courage, and no time. I did literally the only thing I could think to do. I closed my eyes and pretended to sleep. Mind racing, I listened. The footsteps had stopped. I dared for a moment to let myself believe that everything was okay. It was just a wild animal. This is all just crazy. And then I heard the zipper, slowly pulling the flap open. I shut. I couldn't see who it was, but I could hear. I could hear them breathing as they looked around inside of the tent. I could hear them move right up beside me. I could feel their hot breath on my cheek, their face only inches from mine. I could feel their finger slowly pushing a strand of my hair back behind my ear. I didn't know how I did it, but I didn't move. I didn't cry. I didn't open my eyes. I just laid there, paralyzed by fear, realizing my life could end at any moment. After an eternity, the hot breath was gone. I heard more movement, then a zipper, and then stealthily footsteps slowly moved away. But not before I heard one last thing. After a few steps, the footsteps stopped. And then they uttered three words that will haunt me until the day I die. Sweet dreams, Kate. I laid awake that entire night, twitching at the sound, too afraid to do anything. The moment the sun came up, I was out of there. I packed up in record time and retraced my path at a strong power walk, checking over my shoulder and looking around everywhere. Meanwhile, my mind was racing. How did they know my name? I really didn't know. It could have been that creepy hiker I met my first day. I have no idea. I got back to my car and immediately called the police. As I told them what happened, I insisted I had proof, 
I had the worst realization possible. I had been so freaked out and speeding while packing that morning that I hadn't even realized until just that moment. My camera was gone. Did I drop it or leave it behind? I can't say for sure. I think that creep must have grabbed it when he was right next to me in the tent. It had to be in arm's reach. The police said that they would look into it, but I'm not sure how they can investigate this. I couldn't give an exact location of where my campsite was, and what could they do with that information anyways? As I write this down, I am thoroughly freaked out and just trying to get down everything that happened. I still have another scheduled day of paid vacation that I think I really need. So I'm just going to stay in tomorrow and just try to get my thoughts in order. Thank you for listening to me throughout this. I am just so rattled, it's unbelievable. If you have the time, I would really appreciate if you could meet up with me tomorrow to talk. So I'm a pretty big skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and these kinds of subreddits. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House in Boston, Molly Brown House in Denver, the Whaley House in San Diego, Alcatraz at night, and the Winchester House more than once. None of which had yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe, but also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and get away with my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to go hit the slopes. It was January, so it's still winter at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people or 5 couples. One entire lower floor basement level with 2 beds, a room on the first floor and 3 rooms upstairs. Also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California, with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing particular about it, and there are other people staying around. Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in my story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area, and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn around the large and cozy living room and family room where we imbibed. Almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings. Except towards the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that the balloons were getting attracted towards the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that had popped were near the vents. Cool. Just took note. Didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night and all the lights were off, we could hear balloons pop downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 a.m. The next morning, Still plenty of healthy balloons thrown about. Fast forward to night two. After we return from snow activities, we prep for drinking and the usual. After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we are all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night 
and decide to retire at around 11.30 midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat heater. Our couple of friends across the hall had their doors slightly open ajar, lights were on, and bathroom was in use. As I am going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak and figured it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point and the creak continues, and then I hear it stop a few feet behind me near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, What's up, dude? Need something? I turned around and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched, and it is indeed every bit dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback and my skeptical ass once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I go back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple notches. Nothing crazy. I turn the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and step once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own steps this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd the creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the fool's ball table several feet away near the fireplace audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around and I certainly am too far to touch it. I froze in fear and hastily got upstairs back to sleep, not knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually sleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought by my girlfriend's friend couple who stayed across the hall. I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and disclose them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale, gets serious, and tells us that the previous night, she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode after blinking and realizing it wasn't a dream or hallucination and shook her boyfriend awake, who I thought followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear. This by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the room next to us, then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds from the walls in a cabin. These events stand alone could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively it's hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe had made me more of a believer. I don't know why I'm writing this all down. I mean, no one would believe me, and maybe no one will. But no matter how hard I try to rationalize away what happened, I know what I saw. It wasn't the first summer the four of us had spent together at the annual youth camp about an hour away from my house. I still remember their carefree faces. Smiling, laughing. None of us knew this trip 
would be our last. As we arrived at the camp, we unloaded our bags from the car and headed towards our cabin. The sun was shining brightly, the birds were chirping, and the air was filled with the sound of laughter. We settled into our cabin after orientation and looked forward to our activities for the week. We were all excited to be back together again. The first few days were filled with swimming, singing around the campfire, and exploring the nature trails. It was on the fourth night that things started to get strange. We were all sitting around the campfire, roasting marshmallows and telling ghost stories. That's when we heard the rustling in the bushes. At first, we thought it was just an animal, but then we saw it. What's that? Jack asked, pointing behind me. I chuckled. Hardy hard, dude. I'm not falling for it. Nah, man, just look. He insisted. I rolled my eyes and slowly looked over my shoulder. A pair of glowing eyes stared back at me from the undergrowth, just beyond the firelight. My heart immediately started beating faster as whatever this thing was seemed to blink as it watched us in silence. Get back, kids, behind me. Jim, the lead counselor at camp, stepped forward with some small pots we used to cook. As we all scurried to one side, he opened his jacket and started banging the pots together, shouting at our uninvited guest. As we watched breathlessly as the creature let out a blood-curdling screech and stood up on two legs, startled by the sudden movement. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was tall, with matted fur covering its entire body, and sharp claws that glinted in the firelight. Its eyes were piercing and seemed to glow with an otherworldly intensity. As Jim continued to bang the pots, the creature made a sudden move, charging at us with frightening speed. We all screamed and scattered, trying to get as far away from the creature as possible. I stumbled and fell, my ankle twisting painfully under me. I cried out in pain, trying to crawl away from the creature as it seized Jim, tearing into him mercilessly. I buried my head in the dirt, frozen in terror, trying to block out his dying screams, assented by the crunching, squelching sounds of his flesh being consumed alive. I closed my eyes, bracing for the worst. But then everything went silent. I opened my eyes slowly, expecting to see the creature standing over me, ready to strike. Instead, sunlight blinded me as soon as I raised my head, and reflexively closed my eyes again. I squinted and raised my hand to my forehead, searching frantically for any signs of the creature. No one was there. Not only was there no sign of it, nothing remained of my friends, or Jim, save for a small slick of blood and viscera on the ground where he had been killed. I tried to stand, but my ankle gave out on me and I fell back to the ground. Pain shot through the joint and a sharp spasm shot up my leg. I closed my eyes and tried to focus which was difficult since I was still coming down from the shock of what had just happened. I slowly stood up, fighting back a wave of nausea and pain. I stepped over to the mess that had once been the head counselor and gagged. With no idea of where to turn, I limped through the woods, following the winding trail that would eventually lead me back towards the main cabins. I was about halfway there when I saw another counselor coming up the trail. I broke down crying, my body racked with sharp spasms as I struggled to catch my breath. Seeing me in turn, Brandon broke into a run until he caught up with me. Jack! Derek! Oh my god! Where are you? I cried, nearly delirious. Jack! Where are you? Tell me you're okay, please! I sobbed clinging to Brandon's shoulder as he knelt beside me. Hey, hey now, it's okay, I'm here. Everything's gonna be alright. 
He reassured me. What happened to you? Are you hurt? He asked, looking over me. He saw my ankle and gasped. Oh, wow. We need to get you to a doctor. He, they, the monster. I rambled, done in by pain and exhaustion. Brandon pulled out his cell phone and dialed 911. 911, what is your emergency? Asked the operator on the other end. I need an ambulance. I have a friend who was attacked by a wild animal. What kind of animal? I'm, I'm not really sure. It was just some kind of big fur-covered thing with teeth and claws. Alright, I'm sending someone right away. Where are you? I'm at the campground off Highway 18. We're just off the main trail west of the cabins. Okay, the ambulance and police will be there as soon as possible. Stay with your friend. Brandon hung up the phone and looked down at me. The ambulance is on the way. We can't stay here. It's too dangerous. Let's get you back to the cabin so we could have something more comfortable to lie on. He scooped me up and carried me the rest of the way to the cabin. I made it to the hospital eventually and, aside from my sprained ankle, shattered nerves and some scrapes, I was alright. My friends weren't though. They were never found. Not a single trace. I explained to everyone who would listen what I had seen, but it didn't do any good. I was written off as a grief-stricken child whose mind had created what it wanted to see to make sense of my trauma. The camp was deserted immediately and the police never did find the creature. To make matters worse, when they found Jim's body, the attack was blamed on a mountain lion found in the area. But I didn't buy it. I know what I saw, and it was no cougar. My parents tried to convince me that the trauma from seeing my friend murdered had left me with some kind of delusion. But they don't understand. I'm hoping that if I get this written down, maybe someone will finally believe me. I have to believe that the memory of what I saw that day will stop haunting me. Someday. Last school year, we had a new kid. Let's call her Tiffany, or Tiff for short. She definitely reeked of R&R, &R, rich rents. Which made sense because I go to a private school on scholarship. Anywho. We became friends pretty fast. She hated the other kids in our grade, especially because they tried to suck up to her the second she walked in the class. Apparently she was draped in the best designer, some before they were released to the public. Everyone wanted to be her friend, and there were rumors her parents were celebrities or something. Tiff transferred near the end of the school year, which was odd, and she never explained to me why. I don't care too much if I'm being honest. She invited me over for dinner one night and I was excited because she told me all about her dogs and cats. It was a fun night of cuddles, pets, and the most delicious pizza I have ever had the honor of eating. They made it in their yard on a grill smoker thing whatever. It held all the finest ingredients and danced in my mouth all the way down to my stuffed belly. Her parents asked if she was excited for summer camp and she shrugged, leaning her head on her hand. I thought it'd be cool if I could just stay here with Bella for the summer. They looked at each other and sighed. Simultaneously, they perked up and faced us. You could almost see the image of a light bulb hovering over their heads. Why doesn't Bella go with you? Wouldn't that be fun? She sits straight up and asks me. Would you want to? Would your mom let you? I looked down at my lap and fiddled with my fingers. I don't think we could afford it. I'm sorry. I never was a clingy person, nor did I care about having friends or not. But I suddenly felt a wave of separation anxiety at the thought of not seeing Tiff during the summer. I hoped she wouldn't find a new best friend and forget all about me next year, or worse, transfer schools again. I flinched when her parents laughed together, 
Her mom cradled a glass of wine with her other hand over her chest. Oh, nonsense. If your mom is okay with it, then we wouldn't mind taking care of that for you. I perked up, but sat back down after thinking about it for a moment. My mom would never accept that. She hates when people try to help us with money. Her mom does that thing people do when they are reacting to something they think is sweet and pitiful, making her look like one of those fish with upside down looking mouths. Tiff's dad speaks up. Well, we do get a discount now that Lila works there. We could talk to her ourselves if you'd like. I turned my head to the side and Tiff understood my confusion. Layla's my big sister. She's a camp counselor there, but she's totally lame now. We giggle, and her mom rolls her eyes, then playfully backhands her dad on the shoulder when he begins the chuckle too. Well, that settles it. We could talk to your mom when we drop you off later. I was surprised when my mom said yes, but I didn't dare question it either. Camp was supposed to start a week after the school year, but I was packed way before then. When her parents came to pick me up, my mom ran through the long list of things I already triple checked that I packed. We gave each other a tight, long hug. This was the first time I had ever been away from home for longer than a night, let alone three hours away from each other. I'm not one who normally gets nervous, but this is a new one for me. So I'm used to being able to run to my mom whenever I was in trouble or worried about something. But what if I hated camp? I couldn't immediately go back home even if I wanted to. I mean, I know if it was an emergency, she would drop everything and find a way to come and get me. The good thing is, Tiff's parents said they have great cell phone reception. So if I'm feeling homesick, I could call her whenever I want. When we arrived at camp, all of my anxieties fell away. It was beautiful. There were a hundred kids of different ages gathered an organized crowd and a straight line of 12 adults, one being Layla who was pointed out by Tiff. There were 10 cabins, a mess hall, a lake, and a huge boathouse that all surrounded the gorgeous center of the campgrounds. It reminded me of the quads I would see on my college visits, but less artificial. The grass was mowed recently, but was left with a couple of inches which complemented the bushes, trees, and flowers in bloom. There were a few boulders that we could easily climb and sit on with a friend, and there was one in particular that stood out amongst the rest. I didn't even know if it qualifies as a boulder, or if you could call it a mini cliff. It was in the shape of an upside-down scaling triangle. It didn't look naturally shaped that way, but it feels as if it had existed here longer than anything else. When I would inch closer to it, an eerie feeling crawled along my arms and spine giving me goosebumps. I didn't think too much of it at first, but I always fastened my pace whenever I walked by it. Towards the end of our time at camp, we were getting ready to have our final celebration. There was going to be a performance given by each cabin, some dance numbers, singing, and one cabin even wrote their own little play to perform. I didn't want to leave. Everyone was so nice and fun. We did all sorts of cool things, but I knew I'd be back one day. Hell, this made me want to become being a camp counselor. That was until the day of the performances, the last day at camp. I found out that we would be performing under the creepy boulder as an odd stage of sorts. I thought maybe since the boulder slanted at an angle, it helped block the sun or something. When I asked why, nobody knew. Tiff said it was just what they had always done. The counselors laid out a bunch of picnic blankets for us to sit on, separating us by cabins and organizing in an order by performance. There were two rows, and each group would get up starting the first set of blankets on the left to the right. The energy was off somehow. I couldn't figure out why. 
I couldn't enjoy myself through the performances. I faked my applause and smile. My heart rate spiked a bit more after every performance. Ours was the last to go on. Our cabin had been practicing a dance and I was awfully embarrassed to dance in front of a crowd. So I exaggerated on how bad my period cramps were so they wouldn't force me to participate. When our cabin was done, a woman took the stage and her booming but melodic voice slid into my ears, temporarily drowning out the uneasiness that had grown in the pit of my stomach. At first I assumed she was a camp counselor, but the longer I looked at her, I couldn't place her at all in my memories. Wow, those were some amazing and creative performances. Let's give it up for each other and ourselves. Now the moment we have all been waiting for. A tradition we have been maintaining for almost 170 years. The treasure hunt. Everyone around me cheered and I gave Tiff a confused look. But she just kept staring straight ahead. I gently nudged her with my elbow, but she didn't budge. I thought it was weird, but brushed it off as her trying not to be rude while the lady was talking, which in hindsight was a first. Now you all know the rules and you all know the stakes. All around the campgrounds are 111 hidden bars of gold. You will have to look high and low, sometimes even deep. Whoever takes one will get to bring it home with them and whoever doesn't, well, let's hope that isn't you. She laughs and everyone joins her, but all of her laughs are the same, and every single one of them is laughing at the same exact intervals. The monotone choir filling me with apprehension towards this treasure hunt. I nudge Tip again and she doesn't budge, just continues to laugh. I wave my hand in front of her face and nothing. I wish I ran as far as I could, but I didn't know then what I know now. All right, campers, on my count. Ten. I jump as the choir shouts in unison. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Take it all. Within milliseconds, everyone, including the counselors, collectively shoots up and runs in every single direction. I'm glued to the ground and I am frozen in shock at the events that follow. Maybe a dozen kids stay close by and dig into the ground with their arms, eyes expressionless, but the rest of their face is crunched as they heave dirt out with occasional grunts. My eyebrows arch in confusion and concern. Some of them are digging so fast they constantly fling dirt in their own face and yet they remained unfazed, focused. I look back at the stage and the lady is still there, standing in the exact same spot, unbothered. She half-heartedly observes with a neutral expression on her face. I finally gain the strength to stand and I turn around and see a few kids had climbed up on top of the cabins. One of them is jumping up and down, holding what I assume to be gold bars. In what felt like slow motion. I reached my hand forward and yelled, Watch out! As I am forced to observe only the first act of viciousness of the afternoon. Behind him, a girl shoves her shoulder hard into his back and he stumbles close to the edge. The gold bar falls from his hands and something compels me towards it. Without realizing, I am sprinting in the direction of the cabin and I pick up the bar. Once it's in my hands, time stops for a moment. It's not warm or cool. The texture is like flour, but when I remove one hand, there is no dust, powder, or access of any kind on my fingers. It's a single solid piece of gold. My worry snaps me out of the time trap when I feel a hard thump echo into the ground below me. I slowly turn and see the boy laying on the ground, groaning in pain. It wasn't a deadly fall, but he definitely broke his ankle. He's laying on his stomach and his foot had twisted. All of a sudden, I feel it. 
I feel the collective hunger within me. It's not greed. It's not. It's like an urgency. I didn't want to hold this bar. I need to. The girl jumps off the roof, rolls on the ground into an upright position, and stares through me. I hold the bar like a football in my left arm, and I hold my right arm in front of me, bending 90 degrees at the elbow horizontally as I slam the side of my forearm into her neck. She moans and steps to the side, holding where I took her breath. I run without giving her a second thought. I run towards the boulder. There are maybe 20 kids sitting down, scattered amongst the blankets. Once I reach my cabin's blanket, I recognize the familiar of the current seating arrangement. Everyone is sitting back to where they originally were seated, some of them with dirt stuck in their arms and faces, some with random cuts and developing knots. Out of instinct I didn't have before, I lift up my legs in a half jump and land hard on my ass. It hurts, but the anxiousness had completely disappeared. I look around to the grass and there are only a few kids still digging and two more wrestling over a bar. Wait, no. One of them is a counselor. They both end up back on their feet and in one swift motion she kicks the kids square in the chest. When he falls backwards, she scoops the bar and sprints back to her cabin's blanket. I glance back to the kid and watch him start to dig another hole until a bar soars through the air landing in front of him. Unflinchingly, he immediately grabs it and zips over to his cabin's blanket. I look in the direction of which the bar came from, and there are a few kids who have now separated, continuing the search for the gold bar. A sense of calm had taken over my mind and body. I didn't even register Tiff sitting next to me. She doesn't acknowledge me and faces forwards towards the stage. Kids and counselors zoom in sporadically until almost everyone is back to their seat. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman limping towards us. It's Layla. I thought she may have broken her foot, but there's a kid clinging to her leg. She's clutching the bar tight, and every few steps tries to shake him off, but he won't budge. Once she gets close enough that she thinks she can make it, he opens his mouth wide and chomps deeply into the side of her calf. Her blood cloaks his braces, lips, chin, and runs down her foot. He lets go once she drops the bar out of pain. He snatches it up and races to his spot, not even bothering to wipe the blood off his face. The lady on stage bellows an apology. I'm sorry, but that was the last gold bar. Congratulations to everyone that has successfully taken one. You should be very proud of yourselves. As for you, Layla it is. I'm afraid we can't help you. You will be missed. My fear roars back into my stomach. What the F is she talking about? Layla collapses onto her knees, sobbing. The lady gives us a final statement. Alrighty. Well, I'm afraid that's the end of today's festivities. Thank you for sharing some of your lovely summer with us. We hope to see you again next year. Grab your bags from your cabins and make your way towards the parking lot. Your families are waiting for you there. Take care now. Tiff snaps back to life and looks at me, smiling. Did you like it here? I know it's kind of lame and childish, but it's a lot more fun since you came along. My jaw drops and I am too stunned to speak. All I could muster is the smallest of nods. She gives me a confused look with a small smile. She giggles and pulls me into a single hug. Thank you for making me feel like I'm not alone. You're my best friend. My bottom lip becomes dry because I lost all affection in my face. I gain enough strength to squeak out. Uh-huh. She lets go of me and runs to the cabin. I reluctantly follow after her, and we walk to the parking lot in silence. When we get there, we see her parents are already there, and they're talking to Lila. Once again, they hug her tightly and ignore the bleeding on her leg. Her mom opens her eyes, pulls back, and grins at us when we walk up. 
Hey girls, how was camp? Before she could reply, Layla walks away like a zombie back to camp. Tiff rolls her eyes and hides a smile. I guess it was good. Thank you for letting me bring Bella. Of course, we love Bella. I'm glad you two had a good time. Hey Bella, did she tell you this is where her father and I met? Um, Mom, I don't want to hear this again. What? I just wanted to tell Bella the story. She hasn't heard it yet. Come on now, it's a fun story. Tiff grunts, rolls her eyes, and grabs my bag. Her dad then steps forward and grabs our stuff and throws it into the already open trunk. He slams it shut, places his hands onto his hips and smiles. He arches his back, reaches one arm over his head towards the opposite side, and then after a few seconds, he repeats with the opposite arm. All right, my fair ladies, let's get this long road trip moving. Bella, I know your mom misses you a ton. Let's get you back ASAP. Layla walks back to us with the bag towards what I assume is her car. She opens the door and carelessly tosses her bag in. Tiff covers her eyes with her hands. God, Dad, you're so embarrassing. Let's go. She moves to the car, but I can't really take my eyes off of Layla. I can't shake off everything that had just happened. Why the F are they all acting so casual? Layla opens the driver's door and slides in. She turns on the car, resting her hands on the wheel and stares through the windshield. Bella, you coming? After a few seconds, I walk to the opposite side of the car and hop in without saying a word. Her dad turns on the radio and starts singing along to a song he clearly doesn't know the words to, making her mom laugh and clap. He reverses slowly, then gears into drive. He starts the turn, but before he could move forward, Layla's car screeches and cuts in front of us. She swerves to the right, and maybe a hundred feet later, she crashes into a tree. I can't blink. I can't breathe. I have lost control of my regular bodily functions. The only relief I get is the thought of her parents finally addressing what the F this is. But to my dismay, they continue to sing along to the radio and drive carefully unperturbed. As we drive by, I stare at Layla's destroyed vehicle. Her head crashed through the front windshield, colliding with the tree. The glass shards sticking out of her sides, bleeding profusely. She twitches a few times but I can't take my eyes off of her. I turn and look through the back window and watch her go limp. Her dad turns up the radio even louder. When I got home, I collapsed into my mom's arms crying and telling her what had happened. She called Tiff's parents and they said that Tiff was an only child. There was no Layla and insisted I was sleep deprived because I was homesick. We looked it up online and there was no results for a suicide, a car crash at a campsite, or a treasure hunt tradition at the camp. I know what I saw was real. I know Layla was real. My mom believes me, but didn't believe the story. She was confused when I pointed out the discount her parents said they had because Layla worked there and she looked at me confused. What discount? They told me parents donate money, so there are a few beds dedicated for kids who normally wouldn't be able to attend. Still, doubt creeps into my mind sometimes, but I know what happened. I will never ever go to a summer camp again. Tiff tried to call me a few times, but I didn't pick up. When the school year started, she wasn't there. I still don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. And it keeps me up at night, even now.